evidence-based practices, right? I'm like an EBP geek. Because, uh, the, the, why? Because I want to know as a clinician that, you know, if a child is better off after being with me, right? I want to use treatment modalities that I've been, you, you know, studied, researched, measured, the tried and true, right? Out, Evidence-based and outcome um, uh, measure-based uh, practices. So we use a, a variety at the, at the clinic that I work at right now. About 20% of our caseload is um, between the ages of four and 17. So it's a wide range. And it's not a one size fits all. We all know that um, an integrated approach to treatment is the best way to go, right? Whether that's with psychoeducation to the kids and the family, therapy, whether individual or with the parents, and maybe a, a sprinkling of family consultation outside the kids. Um, and also integrate a collaboration with, with the teachers, with um, the primary care physicians, you know, um, different disciplines that need to be involved. So integrated, holistic, and evidence-based approach to treatment. So this is um, uh, the modalities that we use at my clinic. Um, anyone here who use a different treatment approach or have been uh, exposed to one? or? TFC. TFCPT, thank you. The, um, Texas State offers a really great um, two-day uh, didactic. Oh, okay. Yes. The mm -hmm. Child Action Center for Texas and Austin mm -hmm. also does a training. Very good, yes. Yeah, um, a couple of my clinicians use TFCPT. Yeah. That's their, like, go-to. Gives you a great, great, um, a lot of uh, worksheets and homework and manuals for the parents and the kiddos. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Very good, I like that. It's short term, it's time limited, and you set SMART goals. We all know what SMART goals are. Yeah, I'm holding clients accountable. He is very effective with children, but definitely working in a systemic manner, uh, manner where you include the family, and come up with a family goal. Anyone else? There's one I'd like to talk to you guys about, and you can see this online with a uh, University of California, Davis. It's a 10 course uh, module. Uh, I think three of my clinicians completed it. It's parent-child interaction, uh, interactive therapy actually is what it's called. It's very innovative. And because of we're rolling out telemental health, so we can do um, uh, therapy uh, with you know, the, the families in their home and the clinicians in the office. So we can see them in their natural environment. So um, the, the cornerstone of PCIT is the live coaching that the parents will get as they interact with their children from the clinician. So whether that's life skills, coping, how to manage, how to model behaviors better, et cetera. My clinic is equipped with a um, audio and visual uh, play therapy room. And next door is instead of a two-way window, um, which is you know a little kind of intimidating, right? You don't want to be in an integration room. We have, we have a monitor, so my clinicians will be in the next room with um, their mic talking to the parents as they interact with their kiddos next door with you know, puzzles, coloring, etc. So PCIT, UC Davis, it's free. It's 10, it's 10 courses. It's 10 module course. It's, it's very good. Anyone have used PCIT before? You like? What do you think of PCIT? I like it. I um, am a do early child intervention, so I'm there with the parent, with the family, mm -hmm. and um, it's helping them learn that it's not the experts, so. though, mm -hmm. and giving them the feeling empowered. They usually start off with, "I'm going to be taking the lead initially, and mm -hmm. you follow." And when I direct you to that, and then as they get as they get more as I get more comfortable with that, then I start to back away mm -hmm. and back out. And then the less I have to participate, the more successful I know they are. Yes. And um, and usually it's just I, I go you're doing it's just changing your thought process. It's tweaking what you're already doing mm -hmm. now. Instead of always, well, kids are so used to being told no. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a diet. If you're told what you can't have, what are you going to focus on? You're going to focus on what you can't have. Right. So let's start looking at what we can do. Offering mm -hmm. those alternatives mm -hmm. and saying not yes to everything, but offering our choices versus what instead of focusing on what they've done, let's look at what they can do. Right. Right. And they're like it. It's so great. I'm like I don't feel like I'm like I'm not, I'm not being the mean mom mm -hmm. anymore. Right. I'm like, no, because now your your interactions for so long have been so negative. Mm -hmm. So it's going to take a little time for you to change that. <coughs> we want you to enjoy one another. Right. You know, kid parents and kids don't get to enjoy each other.
and make that time together meaningful, meaningful. and productive. Yeah. Right. So one of the school, uh, child developers says, do you need to do 30 minutes of an activity with your child? Uh, and the mother's like, I'm already stressed, I have to start the mom. I don't, if it's you sitting on the couch vegging with your kid, walk, that's all they want, mm -hmm. it's you. Mm -hmm. That's all they want, it's all they need right now. The, the feed. Everything. Right, thank you. And, and the feedback that I get from my clinicians who use a PCIT is that parents feel so empowered. They feel so empowered because, you know, the, the base of it is like, you already have a skill set, right? You're doing what you're doing, right? In the context of your family dynamic, the needs of your child, your parenting style. But let's tweak it a little bit, right? And the, the counselor, is, it's a collaborative effort. It's not like the counselor telling them what to do. It's guiding them, like you said. And then slowly titrating back with progress that they make each, um, each step of the way. So I want to share real quick about um, one of the toughest cases that, that I've, I've worked with. And um, they're doing way better now. But um, they came to the clinic when we first opened. Um, Dad, uh, post 9-11, special ops um, with the US Army. Um, did four deployments, two to Iraq, two to Afghanistan, right? Um, came home, um, had a history of depression and anxiety, came home with a severe PTSD and traumatic brain injury. Um, never been, you know, he goes to the VA, gets his medications, you know, comes home, goes to work, uh, the wife, and they have three kids. Not a whole lot of interaction, they just go about their own business, the kids go to school, wife goes to work, he goes to work, etc. The last three years, uh, three, no, three years ago, he was hospitalized twice for um, suicidal ideations, right? And this was like maybe 10 years after his last deployment. So that happened. And then the kids starting to have symptoms too, depression, anxiety, and then suicidality. So three, all three kids um, were diagnosed with um, PTSD. You know, they met the criteria, the threshold, and their, their PCL scores were off the charts. Um, like I said, but this was 10 years after the last deployment, right? Um, so talking to mom and dad and to the kids, they, they, they all received family therapy, and then mom and dad received their own individual therapy, and then later on, the kids received their own therapy too. And then we brought the full family together for family therapy. So, and we're able to do that at the clinic because um, we do have the capacity for it. Um, but I just want to stress the fact that it is, it can, there's long-term effects of it and it can be multi-generational as well too, if not addressed. And it, it was costly, you know, a mom lost her job because of, you know, what was happening with the kids and um, with herself and with her spouse and um, kids lost months in, you know, in school because of taking care of the hospitalizations, et cetera. So, um, so I, want, I want to share, that was one of us, our toughest cases, but now they're really great. They're doing great. Um, they're all, uh, they've done, they're finished their therapy and they're continuing with their medication management and they go to our uh, self-care groups. You know, we have men's support group, women's support group. Um, we also have a caregiver support group and we're trying to launch um, a teen support group. There's um, maybe partnering some partnering with some agencies in town, like Clarity, except for whoever, um, because there is a shortage for um, teenage support groups here in San Antonio. So. Um, just want to share that. It's one of our success stories. All right, self-care. This is my favorite topic because in order to, work, to do uh, the work that we do, we need to take care of ourselves and we need to take care of each other. It is our responsibility, right? No one else. I mean, no one's going to take care of you better than you take care of yourself, I think. Only if you have insight and if you're self-aware. Or if you surround yourself with people who really care about you and are pointing out to you and force you to do it, right? So um, reflections about consequences of caring. Um, so the more trauma-related events we witness secondarily and the more frequent the exposure we experience, the more helping professional is impacted. This is a true statement, right? You hear the same... Um, stories and horrors of, of, of war, of trauma, of, of sexual assault, whatever the index trauma is, you know, it doesn't get normalized. No, it doesn't. It sticks to us, right? Sometimes we bring it home. 
Sometimes it sits in our gut. That's where I carry my stress. Sometimes, you know, it carries over. You know, as much, uh, um, we, we try to minimize that, um, I think consciously, but it does, it does bleed into our personal lives. Um, you know, helping professionals with their own traumatic histories are more likely to be negatively affected. That makes sense, because you're already coming in with your own trauma, so you're more, even more vulnerable. So it's something to look out for in yourself and with, with the team that you work with. Okay. And also, um, of course, heavy caseload, multiple clients with severe trauma do contribute to secondary stress. So it's always, well, specialty clinics like mine, uh, we do a lot of PTSD work. We do the protocols, PE, CPT, CBT. Um, so those clinicians, I try not to give them a full caseload of nothing but PTSD diagnosis. Okay, that's really hard work. It's really hard work. So it, it's very um, important for uh, managers and clinical supervisors to kind of diversify your staff's caseload as much as you can, you know, depending on their um, area of expertise, their training, their discipline, and of course, obviously their, their competency level as well. Right? Symptoms of secondary stress. What have you seen in your friends, in your colleagues, coworkers? Yeah, I got kind of a shocking story about this right here. Yes, sir. Uh, I'll make it short, but uh, I'm, what happened, I served, and, uh, and I, you know, I kind of grew up like a real tight family and all that, but when I was doing my internship with uh, Lady of the Lake, mm -hmm. I got taken over there to, uh, I started working with the uh, mental patients at the hospital. Mm -hmm. And some of those stories that I heard for the assessments, I didn't know that uh, it was gonna trigger stuff, right? So, to make a long story short, right before I graduated, uh, I lived downtown and I lost, I had like an old fashioned breakdown, no drugs, no alcohol involved, just something, I had a mental breakdown right before I graduated. And the SWAT team got called because they're like, hey, this is a former ranger, and I don't know what they thought I was, but I just went crazy. And I got taken to the hospital by the SWAT team after they beat me up. Oh, wow. And uh, no, so I actually lived this, and what happened um, a couple of days after spending some time there, and they figured out that, hey, this guy's not on drugs. And uh, well, then, of course, I was feeling okay all of a sudden. And I was able to go back to school, and everything worked out. and I'm, I'm uh, doing a PhD now, but this stuff, um, what I learned from it is just like you were saying that some stuff that happened 30 years ago finally came back and my, my kids were like, Dad, what happened? I mean, and I was like, you got me. I mean, I, I didn't know these guys were out there. That's why we had this seven hour standoff. I really lost track of them. And again, I was, it could happen to anybody because like I said, I was doing good in school. Mm -hmm just about to graduate, just winding it up. But some of that stuff that I heard at the mental hospital got Triggered. to me. And, and uh, later on, my, my classmates and some of my friends, that uh, they all they all say, like, you know what? You were sending some weird texts to them. OK, well, from now on. <laughs> let me know. From Please now let on, me know. Like, I'm not being philosophical. If I'm sending long texts, <laughs> call somebody. <because laughs> it's better than having SWAT team coming over. Right. Yes, I but mean, wow, but, but that's my personal story. Th yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. And, and you, you hit it right in the head. You know, it's, there, there's no expiration date. There is no expiration date. Yeah. So, so thank you. Because okay. I haven't been diagnosed with PTSD or any of that. I had an actually lucky career. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why it was surprising to me, too. And uh, this happened about a year ago, and I, I still haven't figured out, nobody has that has talked to me, um, what happened. Just a good old fashioned mental breakdown. It's like Play-Doh. I play with Play-Doh. When you're playing with Play-Doh and you start to squeeze it, you try, the more that you try to contain it, the more it starts to squeeze it. It bleeds out. It's going to find its way out somehow. It will. So I call it the Play-Doh effect. I like that. Play-Doh effect. We use a lot of Play-Doh at the clinic. <laughs> the Play-Doh effect. The more you squeeze it out, the more it will bleed different areas of your life. So I figured, uh, because they haven't figured out what really went wrong, and uh, even though I'm a licensed social worker now, mm -hmm. I'm gonna try to get 
more education so hopefully I can tell this story and turn it around mm -hmm. because if, if I try to go out there and just work I think they'll be like you know when you mention like yeah I had this SWAT standoff and they might have a problem with it right you know? but but you know what sir have, have, have you looked into um, prolonged exposure like read up read up on it because okay. it, 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 it will help you identify the your index trauma whatever that was right with the guide with the guidance of your counselor and then you can do all kinds of, you know, in vivo or imaginary um, um, exposures to help identify that. Yeah, and I'm, I'm actually in search. I mean, if anybody can help me out, because uh, I, I went to the to the uh, VA, you know, because I'm a, I get service there, but I didn't get any results because uh, once they saw, like, hey, this guy's dressing good, he shaves, and he's back in school, so. I get the, oh, you're fine. Functionality is high. Yeah, and I'm looking at him like, well, They triage you. I got beat up by a SWAT team, man. Mm -hmm. That's not fine. Like, it's not. And, uh, and, and they just wrote me off. Like, they just released me in there. I'm on no medication or anything. And, uh, and I am functioning, but I was like, man, I want to know, like, what, what happened. And because I, I didn't see it coming, and nobody did. And, I, and uh, you know, I'm not a loner, so all these people laid mm -hmm. out, they're like, yeah, you were. We thought you were just like, you know, school was doing that too, you know. No, I was, I was about to have Please, please get with Alana okay. before you leave, okay? Awesome. Come see us. Oh, there you go. Wounded warrior. Yeah, yeah, let me mm -hmm. get your contact before we leave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the thing is, if, if, if you cannot, if you don't fully understand what happened, it may happen again and you're not going to be well prepared. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was yes, no sir. fun, I mean. Right. Thank you for sharing that. That's very raw. Very raw.